My guest today is Gina Gardner, who is a multiple number one international best-selling author, empowerment speaker, and genuine leadership power enhancer founder of Genuinely You Leadership. With more than 30 plus years of experience, she helps leaders become more enlightened and limitless in their impact and income so they achieve and sustain holistic profitability in their personal and professional missions. Today, she shares her wisdom and how you too can be an enlightened leader. Welcome to Lifeology, Gina. Oh, thank you so much for having me on the show. My listeners may or may not remember this, but you were on my show last year sometimes, and we had a, uh, sometime, and we had a wonderful conversation, so I can't wait to pick up from where we left off. And you've done so much, and you've written so many books of late that you are going to be the expert today in helping us become an empowered leader. What is... Oh, what, I, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, well help me understand. Uh, what is an enlightened leader? What's the difference? It's, so an enlightened leader is someone who has an awareness of how they turn up in the world. Mm -hmm. They know themselves, that they are truly authentic, Mm -hmm. that they take radical responsibility for themselves, that whatever they think, their emotions, what they say, what they do, that they step into their genuine power. And that's very different to the sort of power we see around the world at the moment. Because if you're in your genuine power, it's not about diminishing somebody else. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It is about oh, like that. recognizing yes. that in, in in embracing your own potential and being truly authentic, you have then the opportunity to nurture and grow the potential of other people. I like that. It's about recognizing that you know you have a real sense of purpose, mm-hmm. a sense of why, and you want to make a positive difference to others and to the world. Sure. And we need it so desperately. Oh my goodness, we certainly do. You mentioned the word radical. And that, in yes. psychology, we have what's called radical acceptance. Radical acceptance is, accept, is uh, accepting the facts as they are. 100%, this is how it is without emotion. You can't change anything, but you can accept it. Like, this is the reality, this is the truth, and I'm going to walk in that with the ability to do whatever it is I think is healthy. Help me understand your version of radical when you're speaking about leadership. So... Let me give you an example of uh, of leadership where it's not radical okay. responsibility okay. Like and that. why that's so important. Because I think people who are listening or watching will then get a much better understanding. So I've worked with many leaders over the years. Mm-hmm. And one of the most common complaints that leaders have is, you know, it, delegation is it's easier to do it yourself because at least you know oh, it's done exactly. properly. I struggle with that, yes. Okay. <laughs> sure. So... They, the, the reason it's not working, according to them, is all external. Mm. When you take radical, mm. total responsibility for your leadership, it is, what is it, how is it that I'm showing up that means that my staff don't take ownership of what's going uh, on? Oh, I, I see. So, and there are a number of, of individual reasons, but most often it's it's a combination. So it mm-hmm. could be that you've not appointed the right people, that they've not been trained in the right way, that you micromanage. And so they know that if they do it, you're going to say it's not done the way I want it Mm. done. So I'll do it myself. So they give up or Mm. they're not clear about the vision. So people have got no ownership or there's no clarity in terms of expectation. Sure. um, And that they've not recognized that, that we're speaking and mm-hmm. there's two languages going on. Sure. And what we're doing at the moment is actually coming to an understanding of a shared language. You've asked me what I meant by radical. Prior to me talking about what I mean by radical, um, you may have assumed that my version of radical was identical mm-hmm. to your version mm-hmm. of radical. And so part of what enlightened leaders do is recognize that in any given relationship personal or or professional Mm -hmm. there are the languages of both people and the language of together Mm -hmm. and so enlightened leaders create a shared language within their team or their organization so an example of that would be people bandy the word excellent around Mm -hmm. no we strive for excellence (laughs) but what does it mean what does it mean exactly (laughs) but if you are able to identify what are the core values that underpin Uh, excellence and what are the behaviors that you need to experience in order for uh, you to recognize excellence what's the difference between okay and good Mm -hmm. and good and excellent collectively then you'll find that everybody has a shared understanding i like that 
taking radical responsibility as a leader means that the first place you start is with yourself. However, it's without the judgment. Mm. Aren't I terrible? I must, uh, sure. you know, I, I must be doing it all wrong. This is about I recognise I, I have contributed in some significant way to what's going on. Mm-hmm. What can I do? How can I be? So I provide the platform, the environment where everybody can thrive and and engage in making the vision a reality. I, re- I really appreciate you saying that. What The way I'm hearing that as well is as the leader, yes, we are the quote top, but we're the foundation. So if my foundation is wonky or it's not clear, then it's going to be on, like on shifting sand. You're walking, you're not sure what's going to happen. Any house that's built Absolutely. on shifting sand is going to fall down. So I can understand the con- the concept of what you mean being very intentional in your word choices, recognizing that there's a denotation and a connotation, which my listeners may or may not know means it's either what it literally means or what you think it means. And so there's a difference in that respect. And so when you really are clear on that, everybody understands the mission and the vision and are able to walk in a unified body, if you will, to create the outcome that one is looking for. And then when you've created a truly learning organization Mm -hmm. where the only two failures are the failure to give it a go and the failure to learn when it hasn't worked, where everybody is involved Mm -hmm. and sees themselves as the leading professional for whatever they do, whether that's the cleaner or the CEO, takes a pride in it, Mm -hmm. then those organizations fly and the people within it thrive. And one of the challenges that we've got worldwide is the levels of stress and unhappiness Mm -hmm. in huge part because of poor leadership. Sure. And that has an impact on performance, um, on staff absenteeism, which Mm -hmm. has a a cost in terms of, you know, if somebody's absent, somebody's got to try and fill the gap. Sure. But the loss of potential is just enormous. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you lead from a different stance, you can harness that potential and those people will be engaged. And, you know, when you look at the research for motivation, money is about number five. Sure. Having ownership, feeling valued, feeling that you are making an active and valuable contribution, which is recognized generally top of the list. Really? So it's the affirmation and just the validation of your hard work and your contribution. Makes sense. And re- well, it's more than just the validation and the thank you. It's the you taking on board that you are making ah, a difference. Oh, I see. So you are towards. Okay. A, Makes sense. I so it's that. at several levels, mm-hmm. but it means that you've engaged with the vision. Sure. So your vision, your you mind ownership leader, of it. Mm-hmm. Your vision is something that I I really believe in too. Yeah. I want I want to do what I can to make your vision work. And you are recognizing my contribution, my creativity, my solution finding. Sure. I like that. So that generates even more motivation to, to move ahead. Makes perfect sense. And leadership is not just leading down. It's leading across and leading uh, rather uh, and leading up. So mm-hmm. leadership is how do, you, how do you learn to lead as a subordinate? How oh, do you learn to like lead yeah. as a team member? Uh-huh. So it's not one dimensional. Sure. And, I, you know, I like well, I'm going to piggyback off that in just a second, but I wanted to reflect earlier when you first started talking about the enlightened leader and you had, were talking about really empowering those below you. So sometimes a leader can be tyrannical or tyrant of some sort, and they just tell people what to do. Whereas your version of the enlightened leader, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is more about you see the skills and the skill set and the potential in other people and you work with them. So they become leaders. So the enlightened leader is not threatened. They simply see and they allow that person to become and flourish in their own leadership ability. And then from there, that's where everybody grows. Because I think the the misunderstanding with some leaders is if this person is greater than me, then all of a sudden I'm no longer a leader. And that insecurity is then threatened. And therefore their their style of leadership is more, you know, putting the thumb down of you have to do what I say type of thing. And as we know, that does not, that that does not engender, um, any type of healthy culture in any situation. It's toxic. It is toxic. But it comes from a place of fear Mm -hmm. of not being enough. And that's why I I started off by saying enlightened leaders work on themselves, that they recognize that actually I've got to have a great sense of self-worth 
without the ego. I often mm -hmm. say, you know, when I'm doing some training, leave your ego under yes. the pillow with your pajamas or your yes. nighty. Yes. You know, because it's not going to serve you. Um, and I think when I, I started off in education, as, as, mm -hmm. as I think you know, mm -hmm. I used to talk about it as being, you know, you don't need to be the best boy or girl in the class. Yeah. So I want, as a, an enlightened leader, I want to choose the very best person. And if they're better at me than an aspect, brilliant. Sure. My job is to bring them together. Oh, My okay. job is to create the vision, share it, create the culture, Sure. to get people engaged in it. And I want the creme de la creme. Mm -hmm. I, and if I, they, they are better at things than I am, brilliant. My job mm -hmm. is, to, is to create the space to, to nurture people to be better than they think they mm -hmm. are and to then make sure that there is a learning environment so they too then start to nurture others. Exactly. And you can do that again. It doesn't have to be top down all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, in organisations, very often it's the new people who come in who've got new ideas, um, and who can see things in a different way that can actually find a way forward. So, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen a jigsaw puzzle of a three mm -hmm. D jigsaw puzzle have, of a tin yes. of beans. Yeah, that's what this is I like. It. It's uh -huh. not one dimensional at all. It comes at every level mm -hmm. and. It's, it's interconnected. But within that, l enlightened leaderships come from a place of courage. Yes. Because sometimes they're having to step out mm -hmm. and, and well, they're, they're just uh, breaking new ground. The courage to be tough at times, sure. but by tough coming from a place of love. Mm -hmm. So if your staff, for example, know that you really do care and value them, you can give them the most um, significant feedback mm -hmm. and say, James, you know, I think that you're better than this. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, what, you, what you're what you doing, you, that's not who you are. Mm -hmm. I want better from you because I know you're better than this. Sure. Yeah. Now, if that came from a place where I was tyrannical, mm -hmm. I was uh, judgmental, I was um, putting people down, that would have a very different energy sure. behind it. But if Certainly. that person knows that I am nurturing them, mm -hmm. that I am wanting the best for them, then those they can take that feedback and it, it acts as, as jet fuel rather than... Uh, dousing them sure. um, and putting them down and i and i, I love that so and i'm sorry keep going no no go go, go on. i i really as i hear that you know i'm thinking of of times when i've been being in those types of positions where i would have to give that type of feedback and one thing i always do and, and you're the expert here but one thing i always do is i make sure that i take a personal inventory before i speak to someone am i in a position to give them this feedback is if i've done if something else is happening there's so much going around and then i sit and talk to them but I've allowed other aspects of my life to get in the way just before I speak, then I may have the best intention, but my presentation is off. So I think it's really important as a leader to also be really mindful about the space that you create prior to speaking to someone to really make sure that you are an enlightened leader, you're aware of what you're experiencing. So therefore you can truly translate what you want to say to the other person or communicate rather, because without that, then what are you really modeling for your staff if you pretend to be enlightened or think you're enlightened, but yet your space you've created, th there's a disconnect between your intent versus your presentation. I think that's true. That comes back to how we started this conversation about mm -hmm. taking radical responsibility. Sure. sure, I love that. You know, take it, and it's a finite. Mm -hmm. You can't take part radical responsibility. It's about the totality sure. of it. And so managing your own emotional self, your your where your mindset is, mm -hmm. um, how the words that you use, the the tone of voice, sure, and so all on, that. all of those contribute. Which is why it's so important that people do the deep inner work on themselves. Yes, but and there is a big but because some people think that doing the inner work means being judgmental ah, and see, getting caught in the story, the illusion mm. that I'm not enough. Sure. Whereas if you come from a place of, I am aware, you can't do anything unless you're aware, can sure. you? You can't sure. take any action. I understand where it's coming from. 
And then what action do I need to take? Mm. And then what energetic vibration is there behind it? You talk about intention. Mm -hmm. And intention is so important. And that go back to what I was saying about people can give really, on the face of it, negative feedback, but in a really constructive way that the other person receives, not as a negative, Mm -hmm. but as an opportunity to develop. And one of the greatest compliments I had when I was a principal of of a large school was when a young member of staff who was going off to get promotion came in and said, I want to thank you because even when it was difficult to hear, I was absolutely sure that it was good for me mm. and you made me want to be better than I, I thought no, I easy, was. Gina. That's wonderful. I love that. And that, you know, that's something very precious. Sure. And so if you're a leader in your family, then that's the way to bring your children up. Of course, of course. You know, if you're in a partner, this stuff is, it's not just work-based. It works in every facet of your life and so for me it's why i'm so passionate about oh and you're it amazing and why at i think it. it's so important <laughs> what would be what would be a the uh, obviously we talked about the radical responsibility to take in uh to take internal stock yeah. what are some additional things that my listeners and viewers today can can practice today and moving forward before they purchase your books or to work with you so an easy way to think about the radical responsibility and also making them though being aware is to be the journalist of your own mm-hmm. life. Mm. And a journalist studies their subject sure. very carefully What are the and looks for the patterns, don't they, mm-hmm. and the exceptions and so on. So become the journalist of your own life. I love that. That's the first thing. The second is the quality of your life is determined by your mindset. Yes, it is. So those people who fear that they will fail are likely to fail. To fail. Because all of their choices will either be about avoiding failing, so often they don't get started and they procrastinate or whatever, Mm -hmm. or you will take a very different set of of decisions than if you, I'm going to succeed, don't know how, Mm -hmm. you don't have to know the how, (laughs) but I'll do what it takes to succeed. And every time it doesn't work is an opportunity to grow and develop. Mm -hmm. And so those very, very different mindsets will determine the quality of your life. I like that. If you think you're not enough, then you're not. Exactly. If you think that you can't do something, then you can't. You can't yeah. because yeah. you're not going to engage it in the same way. I always tell people and you're... the third six... thing... That... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Third thing, go ahead. Go on, go on. The third thing I would say is everything you do is a choice. Even yes. not choosing is a choice. Is a choice. Mm-hmm. And every choice has consequences. And often it's the not actively choosing which has the most far-reaching consequences. Mm-hmm. So you let things drift, yeah? And so I would say to people, have a look at the choices that you're making moment by moment. Yeah. You know, the people who want to lose weight but go for the donut instead of the apple. Mm-hmm. The people who say, you know, isn't so-and-so so successful and I feel really bad that I haven't got that success. Well, how are you showing up? Yes. You know, are you giving up when things get tough or have you not get, got started? Or are you paying lip service to things? So l- look at your choices and through those choices, examine your beliefs about yourself and the world because those beliefs become your reality. Exactly. I would say we are, you are successful as you want to be, as you believe you can be. The, uh, the, you know, the main thing is when I hear you say that, it's a lot of passive thoughts, passive thoughts about hypothetical worries or a hypothetical future. So if I'm, yeah. if I'm stuck with anxiety about what might happen, well, what might yeah. happen probably will happen because I'm not creating action in the now. And so learning how to take the fears and worries, which is, which is energy, but it's internal energy. So to take that internal energy and move it into physical action creates the response you're looking for. So it's just moving that, externalizing that energy to moving forward and do, taking one step. Well, I, people hear me say this all the time. One of my other favorite quotes is, the last person in the race beats the person on the couch. So regardless of what life looks like, you simply (laughs) just get up. I mean, sometimes that's what it is. Just stand up and then you'll find that all of a sudden the world literally looks different because you came from a place of passivity. You stand up and you look around. Now all of a sudden you're at a different level. And that's simply what it's it's a great perspective. Exactly. Different perspective creates a different reality. And with that, it can be as simple as simply just stand up either in your thoughts, literally stand up wherever you are in your house and try something new. 
can I give people a, a little tip for sure. that internal voice that goes on and on and on? Yes, please. One of my, and this doesn't come from me, it comes from one of my clients. We have a talk, because the internal voice that we have can be a real pain. It can be mm. something that really limits you or mm. empowers you. And she was talking about how she was struggling to quieten the voice, particularly at night when she was trying to sleep. Um, and I said, you know, what does the voice sound like? She says, it sounds like a parrot squawking. Oh, <laughs> so I asked her, what do you do with a parrot if it's in a cage and you want it to be quiet? Not that I approve of parrots in sure, cages, sure. but there we yeah. go. And she said, you put a cover over it. Uh-huh. And I said, well, have you thought about, uh, about uh, metaphorically putting a cover uh-huh. over it? Better still, it's not real, the parrot. Why don't you shoot the blessed thing? <laughs> <laughs> which made her laugh and as That's soon really... as you laugh yeah. you're in a very different state yes, so are. if you've got that. an internal vo- voice that goes on and on and <laughs> nags you just shoot the flaming parrot <laughs> that's hysterical, Gina. I love it. With that in mind, we, unfortunately, we have to close out. Thank you so much, Gina Garner, for being an amazing guest on my show today. And you're definitely going to be back in the future. But if my listeners want to find out more information about you, to purchase your books, and to be a part of your enlightened, enlightened leadership programs, where would they find all this information online? So if you go to um, genuinely-you.com or enlightenedleadership.co and ginagardnerassociates.co.uk, uh, there are three different training sites, each with got a different flavor, but you'll find loads of resources. Wonderful. I'm on YouTube. Um, uh, it's uh, a Genuinely You with Gina Gardner. And you can find me on all the social media sites. Excellent. Well, my listeners also know that if they cannot find this information any other place, simply go to the show notes at jamesmillerlifeology.com and just simply search for Gina Gardner and you will find her all over my site. And it will also connect you with Gina. Thank you so much for being a wonderful guest on my show today. I, we have so much more to talk about after the show's over. Thank you very much for having me on. It's been an absolute pleasure.